Good afternoon. Welcome to the webinar. This is James Newcomb uh, from uh, from Rocky Mountain Institute, uh, joined by Chris Nelder, and we are pleased to be able to share with you a preview of a forthcoming eLab report, Electric Vehicle Charging as a Distributed Energy Resource. We've been working on this paper for, must be four or five months now, Chris, uh, and I think for both of us it's been a striking period. It's uh, an interesting moment when you have a chance to work on a topic that is changing in real time as you study it. There have been a variety of important uh, developments in terms of new technology announcements, new business models, and uh, new regulatory frameworks unfolding in the course of this work. And that's just one indicator, I think, an important indicator of the sense of opportunity and movement in the space. Uh, there are a variety of other shoes yet to drop. Uh, from what we know, uh, there's tremendous activity in uh, companies that are active in this sector looking ahead. So it's a very dynamic space. What we want to share with you today is some perspective from the research that we've done that frames these opportunities and potential implications for uh, integration into the grid. And uh, I want to say just a couple of words in terms of framing. We have characterized the significance of, of uh, electric vehicle charging as a distributed energy resource for particular reasons because of the local character and potentially local impacts of some of the types of charging scenarios that we've looked at as well as the load shape implications. We'll have a chance to drill down into some of what's happening there from a technology perspective and from a utility policy and rate making perspective and we'll look forward to your questions at the end of this call. I want to say uh, before we launch into the rest of that uh, just add uh, one additional observation. This work sits at the intersection of RMI's electricity platform work and our uh, extensive uh, eLab network relationships that have helped to inform and, and guide this work. And it also connects to work being done here by our uh, transportation and mobility transformation team at RMI from whom we've learned a lot in the in the course of this work. So hopefully uh, we and you are all beneficiaries of that intersection and uh, what we've learned from the mobility team is that it's a very dynamic area uh, not just in terms of improving economics of, of EVs and increased accessibility and performance of the kind of portfolio of vehicles that we're seeing now and likely to see in the next few years but also uh, because of the dynamism of business models in the space and it's here where I think electric utilities, ISOs, uh, the whole range of stakeholders in the electricity system will be well advised to pay close attention to the changes that are underway because they could ultimately bring some uh, very significant consequence to this intersection of uh, electric vehicle charging and the implications for uh, grid investment, avoided costs, and other uh, dimensions of uh, grid economics. So with that by way of introduction, I'm going to turn it over to Chris to walk us through the slides. Uh, we'll have a chance at the end to come back to your questions and very much look forward to those. Chris? Thanks, James. Um, so we're going to have about a 25-30 minute presentation here. Uh, just going over some of the core findings of the report. Um, and then we'll have uh, a long Q&A session afterward, uh, depending on the level of interest. So uh, feel free to jot your questions down and type them into the chat box there. And we will uh, hopefully have a chance to get to all of them uh, before the end. So I just wanted to um, emphasize that uh, not only is this a production of the eLab, but that our uh, co contributing partners on this production on this paper were the uh, Regulatory Assistance Project, or RAP, and uh, San Diego Gas and Electric, who provided us with some very uh, helpful content. So moving right into the presentation then, uh, we have, okay, there we go. So the, uh, the main thing that I think it's important to understand about this is that there are growth drivers 
uh, that are that are causing uh, this stuff to that are causing electric vehicles to be adopted much more quickly than we might have expected. Um, so, uh, for starters, uh, electric vehicles are much cheaper to refuel than regular gasoline vehicles. They cost about one third as much um, to to fuel up. Uh, the lower cost of ownership than internal combustion engines, uh, depending on where you are and what your grid power prices are now, uh, they could be cheaper today on a total cost of ownership basis, or they will be in the near future. Uh, there are numerous incentives available for buying uh, an EV. There's federal tax credit up to $7,500, state tax credits up to $6,000, and a variety of, of other incentives available on a, on a state and municipal basis, like access to HOV lanes and other cash rebates for charging systems mainly. Uh, there are some really interesting uh, mobility as a service projects uh, that are coming into play here that will use electric vehicles. Um, so for those who aren't familiar with this term, mobility as a service, Basically, it's, it's a set of new solutions where fleets of electric vehicles can be shared between multiple people, but none of them own the vehicles. Uh, mobility as a service vehicles are typically used much more frequently than personally owned vehicles. Um, so instead of sitting parked for 90% of the day, uh, they might actually be in use for 18 hours a day. Um, the largest municipal fleet of EVs in the nation um, was used by, uh, was launched in 2014 by the city of Indianapolis, uh, who deployed a fleet of 425 uh, electric vehicles and plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. Um, and that project is expected to save the city $8.7 million over 10 years, uh, primarily because the fuel cost is so much lower. Uh, RMI currently has uh, some projects going with a number of other uh, entities including Austin, Texas and Alphabet, Google's parent company, to help deploy uh, its electric fully autonomous vehicles to provide mobility service to the public within a year or two. Uh, one of the important uh, players in this space is a company called Vision Fleet, which is a full service enabler and accelerator of EV adoption for fleets. Uh, it offers a suite of technology, data analytics, financing, and operational support. And it is the platform for another entity called Evercar, which is an electric on-demand car sharing service. Uh, aimed at the entrepreneurial drivers like Uber and Lyft, Evercar provides EVs and fast charging services that drivers can use without actually owning the vehicles or being responsible for their maintenance and insurance. Uh, autonomous vehicles, like the ones we're describing here in these mobility as a service plays, could become eventually driverless vehicles as well, uh, robo taxis, uh, for example, and rely on so called charging depots, uh, which would be developed in conjunction with utilities uh, to provide a centralized, low cost place to charge up uh, fleets of electric vehicles and to provide a high value of grid assets uh, through demand response services. And that's what we'll be mainly talking about in this presentation. So I'll jump in here with a quick comment, which is that one of the interesting things about these emerging business models is that they add an extra driver, which is better capitaliz utiliz capital utilization, which accelerates the pace of change even faster than what we might see otherwise. And it's worth noting from a utility perspective that the charging needs of these types of service providers might be very different. They're much more likely to be customers who are looking for a level three fast charge uh, for a vehicle that's being used uh, many more hours of the day. And uh, that will present some different types of challenges uh, for the industry to respond to. So in addition to these mobility as a service plays, which we think is in fact going to be a very exciting driver of EV adoption, um, there are a few other benefits to uh, EVs which are driving their growth. Uh, one of them being that EV use displaces petroleum and that reduces emissions, even on coal heavy grids. Um, so in the service of meeting climate goals, uh, the COP21 pledges, um, we think that EVs are going to be an important part of that solution. Um, 
EVs can also actually reduce average costs for electricity if loads are managed effectively, and we'll explain how that works. And finally, EVs can support greater integration of wind and solar on the grid. So here's one projection of many that are out there uh, explaining where EV growth might actually go. This is from a recent presentation by Bloomberg New Energy Finance, and they're projecting that on the current growth trend um, in which sales are growing at about 65 percent per year, by 2040 uh, they think that long-range electric vehicles under $22,000 sticker price uh, will be 35 percent of all new cars worldwide. Um, and, and that did I say that right? 35% of all new cars worldwide will have a plug, and that by 2040 there will be uh, a number of long-range EVs under $22,000. Right. So there's there's one view of, of the kind of adoption that, that we could actually be looking at. Um, the main thing about electric vehicles uh, that we're focusing on in this paper is how they can be used as a grid resource. Um, and in this case, we're actually not talking about V2G, which is something that uh, has been much, much discussed over the past 10 years, in which vehicles actually supply energy and other uh, capacity back to the grid. We're not talking about that here. We're only talking about G to V, about grid energy being supplied to vehicles. But by using the charging of those vehicles in a dynamic way, we can actually provide a number of services to the grid. So one of the things we can do is we can optimize existing grid assets and extend their useful life by essentially ensuring that the assets on the grid, and here we're talking about generators, we're talking about substations, uh, can generally operate at high levels of utilization most of the time, um, which extends, which, which reduces the wear and tear. Uh, that they would have and extends their life. Um, it helps to avoid new investment in grid infrastructure because we don't have to actually keep investing so much in new peak capacity primarily. Uh, they can supply ancillary services such as frequency regulation and power factor correction by ch charging uh, when supplies are ample and prices are low and stop charging when uh, you're in a peak load condition. They can absorb excess wind and solar generation um, when the output of those uh, resources is high uh, and they would otherwise uh, experience curtailment in order to keep the grid balanced. They can reduce emissions obviously by displacing petroleum. They can reduce electricity and transportation costs uh, as we discussed a moment ago, uh, they're just simply cheaper to refuel, and uh, they can reduce petroleum consumption. So uh, to just discuss a little more deeply the concept of grid optimization, what we're basically talking about here is using EV charging to shape the load of the demand curve. So we're using that to fill in the valleys, turning on EV chargers when uh, when supply is high and demand is low, and then turning them off to avoid the peaks of the load profile. Uh, and so there are two different ways that we mainly talk about doing this. There's the carrot and the stick. So on the carrot side, we're actually using advanced tariff design uh, is one of the ways of doing it, using time of use rates or dynamic real-time pricing. And we'll discuss a, a, a really interesting sdg and &E pilot in a few moments that, that uses the latter. Uh, and that creates incentives to charge when grid power costs are the lowest. And then there's a stick side of it where we're actually allowing utilities to control uh, directly uh, the operation of charging stations or allowing charging station aggregation companies to do that um, in order to control the, the load of charging at the right times. I'll just put down a marker here for an issue that came up in the course of our research. It's an interesting question. Uh, there are those who believe that uh, proper rate design is basically all one needs to do to solve this problem, and others who believe that aggregators uh, are going to play a really key role in, uh, in this uh, future management of, of uh, EV charging. 
it's an issue that we learned a lot about. We have some perspectives on it, and maybe we'll come back to it a little bit more in Q&A. But uh, just one to, to flag for your attention. So to explore what this concept of sort of grid optimization or load profile shaping really means, uh, we presented um, some custom uh, views for uh, five different states of how EV loads could help to change the, the load profile curve. And this is one of those states. This is an example from Hawaii. And what we've done is we've taken the Hawaiian electric company, HECO, uh, we've taken their demand curve in the top chart, and we've just overlaid what a normal, uncontrolled EV charging curve would do to HECO's load profile. So that's what you see in that, in that top chart. And as you can see, you've got quite a few people coming home from work after 4 o'clock in the evening and starting to charge their EVs, which actually significantly raises up the peak in their daily load profile. So this is uh, something that some of you might recognize as the duck curve. So what we're basically saying here is that if EV charging is uncontrolled, it exacerbates the duck curve. Now, in the second chart below, you'll see what we've done here is we've done a custom optimization. We've basically manually figured out what would be the best times to have EV chargers turn on um, and to turn off on the Hawaiian grid. And that's what you're seeing there on that lower chart. Um, so with 23% of electric vehicle penetration, and we explained in the paper why we chose that number, um, this is what that load profile could look like. We could actually flatten the duck uh, significantly with a uh, controlled charging of 23% of electric vehicles on the Hawaiian grid. So what we're really talking about here is utility services that electric vehicles can provide. And there's different ways of looking at that, but here are three groupings. Demand response, power quality, and mobility as a service. So under the demand response category, by turning off charges at times of peak load, you're, at, you're providing a demand response service to the grid. And for example, there's one BMW pilot we're aware of on, on PG&E territory where they're actually using a combination of 94 electric vehicles and some stationary storage that can provide 100 kilowatts of demand response capacity to PG&E's grid on demand. Uh, now that's a, that's a significant value to the grid um, and to the grid operator. Uh, we're also saying that this kind of demand response can help avoid capacity investment uh, as you saw in the previous chart, you don't have to increase your peak uh, service uh, as much as you would have otherwise. And it can help customers to avoid demand charges. So where you have, in particular, uh, commercial customers that might have a fleet of vehicles that they're running, um, by changing the times that those vehicles charge, they can actually avoid demand charges um, that get quite expensive. Uh, in the second grouping here, we're talking about power quality services. So here, by using these groups of vehicles, which are operating as a demand response asset, uh, they can provide ancillary services to the grid. Uh, so under that category of ancillary services, we have frequency control, voltage control, uh, transition generation, uh, power factor correction, and um, avoiding uh, ramp rate. Um, extreme ramp rates. Um, so this all gets a little bit technical. Those of you who understand this stuff will know exactly what I'm talking about. Those who don't, don't worry about it. The point is that we're actually using this fleet of EVs to provide a, a stable uh, grid power that's actually within the necessary parameters um, without having to spend a lot of money on, on resources uh, generation resources in particular to achieve the same thing, to, to provide that high quality power. Uh, and finally, under mobility as a service, uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, we have this concept of charging depots or charging hubs. By charging a number of ve vehicles at these kinds of hubs, uh, it can actually reduce the cost 
make them easier to manage and make them easier to operate as a demand response asset. So uh, once again, these vehicles are, are rented, they're not owned. Uh, they're used uh, in a high density fashion, sometimes 18 hours or more a day. And companies that are testing this mobility as a service uh, include Tesla, NRG, a utility, uh, Green Lots, and uh, ChargePoint, which, uh, op which uh, operates and, and builds a network of, of chargers. Just a quick comment to add here. Uh, the types of value that we've described here as demand response or load shape and power quality or ancillary services uh, are uh, moving targets today. We, we don't know exactly where value is going to shake out, but uh, here's an, il an interesting illustration. E-Motor Works, active in the California market, projects about a $500 per vehicle value from that value stack over time. Uh, as I said, you know, our own view is that uh, it's a dynamic marketplace. It's going to take a little while for us to see what those values might shake out to be, but there's certainly a value stack in play here. A second observation is that uh, we're referring generally to some system attributes uh, in this characterization. Behind that, there are many local dynamics. Uh, what we know from adoption patterns we've seen so far is that EV adoption is highly local. If you look at the heat maps of zip code or, or uh, sub-county area adoption, you'll see that there are some very intense areas of adoption in the Bay Area or in San Diego. And those also tell us some important things about future grid pressures and about potentially the importance of workplace charging in some of these markets. Uh, so there's a lot of movement and a lot of opportunity. It tells us that uh, this is an important moment for utilities to start getting their arms around that value proposition from both their own and from the customer's uh, perspective. Among the other benefits of, of electric vehicles, obviously, is uh, the ability to reduce emissions. Um, and this is pretty straightforward. I, I won't belabor it, but some interesting findings from our research uh, is that uh, electric vehicles can actually reduce the net emissions even if they're being charged up on a power grid that gets most of its power from coal compared to conventional vehicles. Um, and this gets into actually a pretty uh, detailed uh, kind of analytics. Um, we have uh, referenced a paper um, in our study here, uh, a new one from, from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory uh, that really explains all the details of, of exactly how this calculus works. But the important takeaway for casual observers is that even if your grid power is mainly uh, coming from coal, electric vehicles can still reduce net emissions. Uh, net EV emissions from the power grid and from a fuel combustion in a conventional vehicle, of course, varies by the generation mix and how that mix changes over time and the time of day that vehicles recharge. So what's the best strategy? The best strategy is to get your electric vehicles on the grid at the same time as you're increasing the amount of renewable energy uh, on your grid. And by doing those two things in concert, um, and in particular by moving toward more workplace charging stations, you can actually decarbonize your grid and your uh, transportation system simultaneously. So another interesting aspect of, of um, EVs is their ability to soak up excess wind and solar generation uh, and to end curtailment when wind and solar are producing more power than the grid can use. Uh, this is becoming an increasingly uh, serious problem um, in places that have a lot of wind, like the Midwest, um, and that have a lot of solar, like the Southwest, um, where they're really struggling to figure out what to do with that excess power rather than just throwing it away through curtailment because we don't really have the storage capacity yet to just absorb it all uh, with like grid batteries. So what we're saying here is that electric vehicles can actually provide that function. Um, according to a National Renewable Energy Laboratory study from 2006, they showed that the deployment of 
plug-in hybrid electric vehicles actually re resulted in a vastly increased use of wind. Uh, so we're actually finding that we can increase the amount of renewable energy on a grid simply by having the EVs available to soak it up. And that it can help actually make variable renewables dispatchable by, because by absorbing the wind and solar when it's producing, and then you can call on uh, EV storage as a demand response is calling on grid generators to provide new supply. So what we'd like to drill down here a little bit um, on California's experience because California has the most electric vehicles of uh, on the road but of any state. It's got about 200,000 right now and, and they're growing rapidly. Um, of course part of that is that it actually uh, the state actually has an electric vehicle deployment target of uh, one, uh, well there's two targets. The first target is uh, enough charging stations to support one million vehicles on the California roads by 2020 and then there's a second target of having 1.5 million zero emission vehicles on California roads by 2025. Uh, so this state has the most experience in electric vehicle pilots and advanced tariff design and by studying the experience that of these pilots in these uh, utility jurisdictions in California we we're able to pull out some interesting findings. Um, so the the main study to reference here uh, is called the EV project. Uh, this is uh, something that we'll discuss in more detail in a moment, but um, San Diego Gas and Electric, as a part of this EV project, uh, tried an experimental tariff design. And what they did is they put together a time of use rate uh, that was sufficient to shift charging to off-peak hours. Um, and they found that when they did not have a time of use rate like that, Drivers just plugged in when they got home, and that increased the peak and it exacerbated the duck curve. So what they did is they tried a number of different um, rate designs, uh, TOU rate designs, and found that they were able to significantly shift uh, the charging of electric vehicles to the off-peak hours by having the right rate structure. Um, San Diego Gas and Electric uh, also uh, has its own aggregated EV fleet vehicles um, and has bid them into uh, CAISO, the, the independent system operator in California, um, bid it into their energy and ancillary services market. So they've actually done this successfully. They've used a fleet of EVs to bid into the CAISO markets. Um, PG&E, uh, uh, with its aforementioned pilot with BMW, uh, has bid 94 vehicles and stationary storage into California's demand response market. And a new program from SDG&E will actually feature hourly dynamic prices that are posted a day ahead. And drivers can use a smartphone application to figure out what are the parameters in which they want to allow their vehicles to charge, observing those rate schedules, and then make sure that their vehicles charge during the lowest cost hours. So to explain the EV project just a little more, uh, this was actually the largest deployment and evaluation project of electric drive and charging infrastructure to date. Um, it was a collaboration between uh, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, the uh, Idaho um, Renewable Energy Laboratory, sorry, the Idaho National Laboratory, um, and uh, a variety of other entities and it involved uh, 12,000 level 2 chargers, um, so that's the sort of the high speed 240 volt uh, charger that you might find in a home or um, in, a, in a commercial or workplace situation. Uh, 100 level 3 chargers, so those would be the high speed chargers, um, and it included uh, over 4 million charging events in 10 states and Washington DC. Uh, and covered 125 million miles worth of uh, vehicle use. So this was a, this was a real data set. This is, this is something that's big enough to give us interesting insights into what you can do with EVs. And what SDG&E found as a part of its participation in the EV project was that drivers would plug in when they got home, uh, but they would delay their charging to the cheapest off-peak hours of their time of use tariff. Uh, and importantly, they found that the charging behavior 
can really be influenced quite effectively during the first few months, but then it gets a lot harder. Uh, so it's really important uh, for EV uh, customers to have the right incentives and to get the right signal right away when they start uh, using uh, and plugging in their EV at home. Uh, stg &E also found that the larger the price differential between the time of use rate intervals, the more shifting of charging that occurred, uh, kind of a no-brainer there. Uh, if you make it even more advantageous, uh, more people are going to take advantage of it. Um, but they did find that there was a limit. Uh, a 6 to 1 ratio between the cost of on-peak and off-peak uh, power was enough, they found, to shift about 90% of charging to off-peak periods. Um, they didn't really feel that more than a 6 to 1 ratio was, was necessary. Um, so the requisites of a good time of use rate structure they found, um, or the requisites for good charging behavior they found was good rate structures, um, having the technology to control charging, uh, telemetry between the charger or the uh, uh, electric vehicle and the utility, and um, a second meter is actually helpful, a revenue grade meter, um, in order to sort of enable the whole process. So here's a little example, uh, a result of San Diego Gas and Electric's tariff design pilot. Um, so here we, what we have is a residential load shape for uh, an entire home. So this is not just the electric vehicle charging. This is actually the electricity consumption of the entire home. Uh, four homes with EVs, and it compares the time of use versus a non-time of use rate. And so you'll see there that in the, that in the green line, uh, that's a non-time of use rate. Uh, there's a pretty substantial uh, head of the duck sticking up there, uh, starting after about uh, 5 o'clock in, in the evening. Um, whereas with the uh, red line, you're seeing a time of use rate effect. And here we have a much lower uh, neck of the duck but a lot more charging has been shifted to the nighttime hours. Um, so this, this chart is on percentage terms. You'll see there on the uh, y-axis. So here uh, you've got about 6% uh, of your daily load under the time of use rate being consumed after midnight or between the hours of about midnight and 4 in the morning. Um, whereas uh, uh, without the time of use rate, you're actually getting close to that number uh, during the peak. So where's, going, where's California going next? Uh, the, as I mentioned earlier, they have a target to deploy enough charging stations to support 1 million electric vehicles by 2020. So San Diego Gas and Electric will deploy, own, and operate uh, about 3,500 charging stations at 350 sites, including multiple-use dwellings like apartment buildings. Um, and so this is uh, it's kind of interesting, actually, what's going on here in California because the three main utilities are taking slightly different approaches. So with SDG&E, they're deploying, owning, and operating the charging stations. Southern California Edison, uh, by contrast, is actually going to provide make ready locations, so meaning they're going to provide uh, the, the wire service uh, up to the point where the charger, charger will be installed for about 1,500 charging stations at workplaces, campuses, recreational areas, and multi-use multi dwellings uh, to be owned and operated by third parties. And then PG&E is actually going to deploy and rate base uh, about 7,500 level 2 and 100 level 3 charging stations, including 20% multi-unit dwellings uh, with optional third-party participation. So one of the things that's coming to the fore for sure in uh, these early programs is an increased focus on workplace charging, which is as it should be. Uh, makes a lot of sense for many reasons. And, um, you know, if you look at this from an overall utility load shape perspective, with, with very few exceptions, uh, the EV load is small enough to be virtually negligible in the years immediately ahead. So why pay so much attention now 
uh, to uh, managing this load shape. We feel pretty strongly, based on what we've learned in, uh, in the work for this report, that it's a really formative time. You're shaping uh, not just customer behavior, which is very important in its own right, but you're also shaping actually the technology and uh, the policy frameworks, the expectations of the market, and where charging infrastructure is actually built. So uh, the early moves in this game, while they may not be especially significant in terms of their immediate direct impacts on load, are arguably very important in terms of their longer term impacts. Um, just one quick correction in response to uh, a question that was submitted. Um, I misspoke earlier when I said multi-use dwelling. It's actually multi-unit dwelling. So we're talking about apartment buildings here, basically. Uh, all right, so moving right along then, an interesting uh, possibility uh, that we're, we're kind of regarding as maybe an outlier, but a worth one worth thinking about here, is what if public charging at workplaces and uh, shopping centers, for example, becomes uh, widely available? Uh, this is an interesting possibility because it's not the way that most EV programs or the way that most utilities are thinking about EVs uh, are, is currently set up. Um, and there's a couple of reasons to think about this scenario. Uh, so under this disruptor category, uh, for one thing we've got vehicle ranges increasing to 200 miles per better or, or better on a charge. Uh, and, and what that means is that you don't have to stay particularly close to home or particularly within a certain range. Uh, it means that your vehicle becomes more of an all-purpose vehicle like your internal combustion engine vehicle is today. It means that mobility as a service options become even more likely to happen. And it means that uh, as mobility as a service becomes more uh, common, that more people are likely to rent vehicles than own them. Um, in which case they're not going to be taking their vehicle home and plugging it in overnight because they won't have one to plug in. So in this type of a scenario with public and workplace charging becoming ubiquitous, you could actually have less charging at home than most utilities or, or even participants like aggregators in the EV space are expecting because they, they won't need to charge it at home uh, all the way. They might, you know, get 60% of the vehicle recharged at work and then get another 10% or another 20% um, when they go shopping after work. And when they get home, they might only need like 20% of the, the batteries charged to be topped off. And for that, they could use the vehicle's onboard level one charger rather than installing an expensive level two charger in their own garage at home. So this actually means that the total uh, load profile of EVs uh, would shift more toward the daytime. It would also mean that public and workplace level three chargers, so those are the fast chargers, could actually have a lower total capital outlay because they could actually be more heavily used. And that higher utilization rate would mean that those chargers are more profitable for companies that operate those charging services, which means that those uh, systems will be better maintained, which means that they'll be more available. Uh, one of the problems that, that we've seen to date with public chargers or, uh, uh, what, what happened here, Mark? It looks like, sorry, it looks like uh, something just went awry. Uh, I'm not sure what happened there. Are we still presenting? Mm -hmm. Stand by, please. Is everybody still there? Yep. Okay. Sorry about that, folks. I don't know what happened there. Um, so if we have more uh, of these public level three chargers being more heavily used and more heavily uh, maintained, then they'll be more profitable and they'll be 
less of a likelihood that somebody will drive up to a shopping center and park in front of a charger and find out that it's not working, uh, which has been kind of a problem up until this point. So in this scenario where you have more public and workplace charging, you've actually got quite different challenges than, than the way that we've thought about EVs and their charging so far. Uh, for one, you have less of a risk of overloading clusters of level two chargers in residential neighborhoods, which is something that it's a topic we focus on pretty heavily in the paper, um, especially in uh, San Diego gas and electric territory. Um, an electric vehicle, if it, uh, let's say your typical um, modern electric vehicle with 30 kilowatt hours of capacity in its battery, uh, could easily use about as much electricity in a day as a home does. And so you can imagine that in a neighborhood where you've got a, like a distribution transformer that's serving a neighborhood of let's say 20 homes, if you suddenly plug in three or four vehicles in that neighborhood on a level two charger at the same time, that's basically like dropping three or four new houses into that neighborhood on that same distribution grid capacity, uh, in which case you run the risk of overloading that equipment. So with this scenario here, public and workplace charging, you have a less risk of, of doing that because most of the charging is actually happening during the day at commercial facilities with heavy duty um, grid connections. Uh, it also means the time of use rates are actually going to be a less effective tool because you're not going to have as much charging happening uh, in those uh, off-peak hours. Um, but conversely, it means that, opportunity, that utilities will have more opportunity to use electric vehicles to soak up uh, excess solar power in the, in, the, in the middle of the day hours, which is actually a good thing for the long-term scenario where you're trying to get to uh, grids with a large proportion of solar power and it would still manage to flatten the duct curve uh, because you're actually now moving more of that load into there in the middle of the day. So uh, we'll conclude this presentation with some recommendations. Um, so to begin with, our recommendations for regulators, we're suggesting that they really ought to focus on creating incentives and tariffs and market opportunities to accelerate the deployment of electric vehicles and charging infrastructure. So to take an active role in really putting in place incentives to support electric vehicles. Uh, uh, on kind of a more technical point, we want them to think about opening wholesale markets to electric vehicles as demand response uh, to enable bi-directional dispatch and service regulation. Uh, that's not something that currently exists in, in a widespread fashion. We also want them to support using electric vehicles deliberately as a way of maximizing renewable generation on the grid and flattening the load profile. And we, as a way of getting there, we would suggest that creating uh, performance-based incentives for high utilization of chargers. So we want to make sure that chargers are being put in places where they're going to be heavily used, while regulators can create performance-based incentives to help make that happen and uh, incentives to make sure that uh, EVs are used to optimize existing grid assets uh, and avoid in, uh, new investments. So we want to make sure that they're being used to fill in the valleys and shave off the peaks. Uh, removing regulatory uncertainty uh, is a very important role here for regulators. Um, there are really a lot of questions which we enumerate to some extent in the report uh, of sort of just unanswerable questions right now because uh, regulators haven't given clear guidance. Um, and finally, we want to recommend that they streamline the interconnection process um, and improve businesses and improve the business opportunity for third-party developers uh, to own and operate charging infrastructure. Recommendations for utilities include developing an awareness of where and how EV charging will affect their distribution system. So as I mentioned earlier, most utilities are currently thinking about people coming home from work and plugging into a level two charger and then thinking about like a time of use rate to make sure that uh, that charger gets used after midnight. Well, if we have 
a more rapid use of uh, or a more rapid build out of public and workplace charging, then it might actually be a very different question for utilities. So they need to have that awareness of where and how EVs are being uh, adopted and used on their systems. Uh, deploying advanced metering infrastructure and uh, telemetry systems uh, is an important part of sort of the enabling technology to allow the control of EV charging to actually be used as a grid asset. Offering well-formed time of use rates is certainly important as we've seen uh, for residential users in particular or other dynamic pricing methods to shift charging toward low cost off peak hours. And here we think the San Diego gas and electric pilot with its day ahead hourly pricing uh, scheme will be really worth watching. Um, we want to support aggregators and public workplace charging development, whether those are owned by the utility or by a third party. Uh, utilities should help guide the placement of workplace and public chargers and charging hubs so that it reduces their installation costs and absorbs wind and solar production more effectively. So here you could think about, for example, uh, a utility giving guidance to a company that wants to deploy a charging hub to say, hey, if you put that on a brownfield over near the substation, uh, the cost of leasing the land is going to be low, the cost of the interconnection is going to be low because it's near our substation, uh, and the power reliability is going to be very high, and then we're going to be able to use that during the day to absorb wind and solar production. So the utility can offer really important guidance here especially to third-party companies that want to deploy charging infrastructure as to where's the best place to put it to reduce installation costs and to absorb the most wind and solar capacity. Uh, and finally, utilities can actually do a lot of outreach to customers uh, to help them understand that the cost of owning an EV is low, to make them familiar uh, with their rate options and how to save money, and what their options are for installing and operating charging equipment. And finally, our recommendations for the private sector. Uh, vehicle uh, manufacturers and dealers can, uh, can work a lot more closely to do today with utilities and aggregators to expand the EV market and encourage well-formed TOU rates because obviously that changes the value proposition for the prospective EV customer and to develop flexible and responsive charging control systems. Um, and there's a lot of different ways that that can be done. Uh, actually, a bewildering number of ways that that can be done. But it's important for now, we think, that vehicle manufacturers and utilities um, and third-party providers can actually just sort of put their heads together and figure out what makes sense for them. Uh, charging station aggregators uh, could work more closely with utilities to make sure that they cite the charging depots for maximum benefit and lowest cost, as I was saying a moment ago, and to convey the value of demand response to regulators, utilities, and customers. So to really advocate for their own cause uh, as a valuable grid asset. Building owners can work with utilities, aggregators, and customers to identify and install chargers at high value, low cost public sites, such as shopping centers, um, and to basically express their willingness to host uh, charging stations like that. Uh, I think that would really help. And finally, for all stakeholders here in the private sector, uh, they could be more vocal about supporting dynamic tariffs, implementing two-way communications and control systems, educating customers and doing all that outreach, and supporting open source and common standards and interfaces. So to summarize then, if we integrate electric vehicles proactively and intelligently, it can reduce new investment in grid infrastructure, optimize the existing grid assets and extend their useful life, enable greater integration of variable renewables like wind and solar without needing new gas generation for dispatchable capacity while simultaneously avoiding the curtailment of existing renewable capacity. It can improve energy security, reduce electricity and transportation costs, reduce petroleum consumption and emissions of CO2 and other air pollutants, provide multiplier benefits from increased money circulating in the community, 
and supply ancillary services to the grid, such as frequency regulation and power factor correction. But if we integrate electric vehicles reactively or badly, it will actually shorten the life of grid infrastructure components because they'll have to ramp up and down a lot more often. It will require greater investment in gas-fired peak and flexible capacity. It'll make the grid less efficient, stable, and reliable. It'll increase the unit cost of electricity for all consumers because we'll have to invest in a lot of new capacity to support the charging being done at the wrong time. It will inhibit the integration of variable renewables because it'll require more on-demand dispatchable gas-fired capacity. And it'll increase the curtailment of renewable generation when supply exceeds demand. And finally, it would increase grid power emissions. So clearly there are some important benefits for doing it right and some really serious downsides for doing it wrong. And that's why we wanted to uh, offer this paper. So with that, Let's take some questions. Really curious as to why you did not cover V to G in your study. Do you feel it does not have much potential, or is it too off in the future, too far off in the future? Or if you do feel V to G has good potential, what kind of demo in V to G would you recommend? Um, yeah, basically uh, the reason we just we didn't cover it is because um, it has been talked about for about a decade now, and it's still really not happening. And we really wanted to focus in this paper on empirical evidence of what was actually happening in the world, uh, of real pilots with real vehicles and real data on customer. And that's just simply not available for v to g because it's just not happening yet at, uh, at any significant scale. Um, can I go back to that question again real quick? Oh, sorry. It's <laughs> it's gone now? Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, anyway. Yeah. Um, so V2G, uh, I think, does in, in time have real uh, potential. Um, certainly, if vehicles were able to supply energy back to the grid, um, it could be uh, an enormously powerful resource. Uh, it could provide the kind of grid storage uh, that's really needed in, in the long run to support very high penetrations of, of variable renewables. But it doesn't really exist yet, and really there's a whole lot of uh, other problems in the way, and we do detail those in the paper. For example, right now, if you actually used a vehicle as a V2G resource, it would invalidate the warranty of the vehicle. Um, so there are, some, there are some real serious obstacles in the way yet of, of V2G, and that's why we explicitly chose not to cover it. Uh, it's not clear how EV plus PV will reduce the need for dispatchable fossil fuel plants in areas where there is a residential cooling peak. Well, these two are linked together. Yeah. I mean, if, if you were looking at a V to G scenario, then possibly uh, one could be uh, pulling some, uh, some juice out of uh, EV batteries in those evening hour peaks. Um, but I think the questioner is right. Uh, there's not really, you know, uh, an option to deal explicitly with that piece of the challenge, as much as there is an option to make sure that we don't make it worse uh, by making sure that the, you know, that either we take advantage of workplace charging or, or rate design that'll push uh, the charging onto later hours. Uh, yeah, there would also be. I mean, I guess my other answer to that would be that you also need to look at. Um, uh, air conditioning as a variable resource as well. So if you had control mechanisms in place, and, and these are being piloted in various places now, where you can actually fire up the air conditioner a few hours earlier than you normally would right after you get home from work, and allow that to be a dynamic load as well, and use that in conjunction with your the performance of your PV system and the charging of your EV, um, I think you can more effectively get where you're, where you're trying to go. So the next question is, what about the model of utility-owned and operated charging stations that are rate-based compared to private-owned and operated charging stations that are not rate-based? Can you discuss the pros and cons? Um, so let's say a few words about it now. There obviously will be more discussion of this in the paper, and we're happy to to follow up with you offline as possible. This is an important piece of the conversation that's been really active in a number of jurisdictions 
uh, in the last few years with some changes in approach, notably in California, as the importance of workplace charging has come to the fore and more utilities have, have uh, argued the case successfully that they have unique uh, capabilities to help bring workplace charging to, to reality. I think it's pretty likely that we'll see some hybrids in many jurisdictions where there are some situations where utilities are uh, allowed to rate-based chargers. These may range from uh, low income to workplace situations and other parts of the market that are uh, reserved to, to the private sector. That's kind of what we're seeing emerging, at least in, in parts of the California uh, situation and, and in other states. But I think it's going to continue to be a, a, an evolution. One of the things that's happening behind the scenes uh, around that is uh, a, a whole evolution of business models of who's actually doing the controlling of charging. Uh, and again, we currently see kind of a mixed bag with some uh, aggregators of EV charging, selling demand response to the Cal ISO, for example. Uh, but uh, the utilities going down the path of uh, where they do uh, are directly involved with charging stations, trying to make uh, rate design drive those decisions. You know, I, I think in some ways this question depends on the value proposition for third-party aggregators because if the value proposition for them is good, um, then we can pretty reliably count on them to deploy the charging stations that we need and to uh, you know, keep the momentum going for the deployment of charging stations and EVs. But where the proposition is not attractive to them, then you really sort of want the utility there to accelerate the deployment of uh, charging stations where, where it might not happen otherwise. So there's a question about uh, the issue of the potential of cross-subsidization of EV drivers by other uh, rate payers, noting that while it may be that in the long run uh, a proper management of EV charging could bring benefits to all customers, that might not be, case, might, might be the case in the near term. And of course there are equity issues that sit behind EV adoption and its implications. Yeah. Good question. So it is. It's a it's a complicated question, uh, you know, of both short term and long term circumstance. Uh, there are many studies uh, that we've reviewed, and some of our own analysis confirms that uh, there are plausible and conventional and convincing scenarios of long term benefit to all customers from getting this right. Now that doesn't mean that the you know it's it's often the case in uh, electric utility regulation that there is some socialization of costs and cost subsidies. It happens all the time in in every jurisdiction. The question is, uh, is it being appropriately handled here? Um, a, a couple thoughts around this. One is that uh, I mentioned that uh, a utility role in uh, charging stations may be justified in order to help to ensure low income access. Uh, we have a, a low income project operating under eLab and have learned a lot about that segment. It's actually a segment that stands to benefit significantly from EV adoption and there may be some pretty interesting models for car sharing and, and other solutions that get vehicles into that segment. So this is one way to go after it is to try to address the equity issues in the ramp up period. Uh, we're seeing some pretty interesting approaches to make that happen. And then uh, I think just keeping track of, uh, keeping accounts of what those cost subsidies might look like is gonna be important both for utilities and regulators over time. Uh, as we've mentioned, there are many wild cards in this picture, not the least of which is you know, the possibility that the market could move more toward uh, customer demand for level three chargers. 
and uh, those can get pretty expensive to the grid if you start, you know, putting up a level three charger hub where you've got a number of level three chargers in one location, all of a sudden we're in a pretty different world and thinking about do we want to socialize those costs that might be benefiting a particular narrow customer segment or even commercial interest. I think those start to be pretty challenging questions for regulators and utilities alike. I would just add that um, in the pilots that are now being uh, developed through the, the, the three big California utilities, there are actually carve-outs in each one of those pilots to make sure that a certain number of the charging stations were being deployed at multi-unit dwellings and low-income uh, areas. Um, so they were specifically trying to avoid uh, this concept of cross-subsidization where only the rich are going to benefit. Uh, and secondly, I'd point out that, you know, sort of the flip side of the cross-subsidization argument is what are your social goals? Uh, you know, we have as a, as a society, we have a certain set of social goals that EVs can help meet. Uh, we want to reduce carbon emissions. We want to reduce our dependence on petroleum. Uh, we want to allow there to be more renewables on the grid. Um, and EVs support all of those social goals. So to the extent, you know, that, that EV charging um, incentives do create some degree of cross-subsidization, that really has to be evaluated against these other social goals. And we have to decide what it is that we really want to achieve. So here's another interesting question. The California peak to off-peak deltas are large, uh, greater than 30 cents a kilowatt hour. In the Northwest, our power prices are much lower. How big does the delta have to be to shift charging behavior? Well, um, <laughs> we've seen evidence that indicates it can be as low as three to one under the right circumstances. And what, is the, what are the right circumstances? I guess one of the lessons we've learned across the people that we've talked to in the industry, the pilots, the experiments going on, is that it's important to shape customer behavior in the early stages of adoption. Um, and so the window for making change is important to catch at the beginning. If you come in later after customers already kind of developed their habit of how they're going to use their vehicle, it's much more difficult. But if you bring them into a program early on that establishes value for them from participation in uh, a load, uh, in, a, in a time of use pricing type of approach, then the chances are a lot better that you can get more out of a lower price differential. Some of the business models like eMotorWorks are basically trying to train their customers to keep their vehicle plugged in as many hours as possible and tell their app when they need the charge by so that uh, the rest sits in the hands of the aggregator who can play all kinds of games uh, selling demand response to the ISO or other services to other parts of the electricity system. So again, that depends on building a relationship with a customer, shaping that customer's behavior from the very beginning and providing real value, which might, you know, be in the hundreds of dollars per vehicle per year again, which is, which is really substantial when you get down to it. But yeah, just to sort of reiterate um, the finding from the SDG&E pilot as a part of the EV project, uh, they found that um, that a, a ratio of six to one between on peak and off peak prices was enough to change the charging habits of 90% of the participants. Uh, I think three to one would work in some places, uh, depending on the mentality of those users. Um, but uh, obviously, there's there's also more to it than than just just the price. All right, here's another rates question. In the long run, won't it become infeasible to distinguish between electrons going to and from an EV versus those going to and from a building generally? And for economic efficiency and fairness, shouldn't all electricity, all electricity use get the time differential offered for EV charging? Well, this is a good question. Uh, there are some uh, utilities that are moving toward separate metering. 
for EVs and arguing that uh, the reason to do that is exactly this kind of behavioral change that they're trying to, to drive. They don't want it. They don't want the customer's behavior to be uh, kind of lumped in with their other electricity use. And in fact, they, some of them even offer special rates strictly for EV charging that will only be available through that meter attached to that charging station. I think the other argument, the other side of this question, and I know, uh, for example, NREL has been very active in integrating their EV charging into their overall building profile so that they're making sure they're not knocking their uh, demand charges higher by virtue of charging on their system peak. So um, we very well may see better building integration of EV charging so that one looks at the rate charged to a building and as some workplace charging, for example, might be added to a, to a building or even a campus, uh, that that uh, charging is done in, a, in an effective way from the customer's perspective. And this is where existing rates may provide some distortion because if I'm in the belly of the duck curve and I'm setting my demand charge because I've got a bunch of EVs charging in the belly of the duck curve, then that's, and I'm paying more for that. It's just a, a perverse incentive from a rates perspective, and, and we probably need to go about fixing those so that we align the actual rate structures with when costs are incurred on the grid. Yeah. So Mark's giving a signal, maybe one more question here. I'll read it out and uh, Chris and I'll take a crack at it. Uh, it says, are there any specific demos you'd recommend to show how EVs can maximize renewable generation? Hmm. Well, uh, certainly one place to keep an eye on uh, because they're uh, farther ahead into some of their renewable penetration scenarios than the rest of us is Hawaii, uh, where the issues are both system level on the islands, but also actually circuit level. If you can help to soak up some of the solar on those uh, feeders, uh, this is the, the direct and immediate problem uh, that's of interest in Hawaii and I think amazing potential. So I think that is one of the horizons for us to have a very close look at. We've been also impressed uh, with some of the pilot work that SDG&E has done, and uh, there's uh, and some of that information is available and will be summarized in the paper. Uh, these are two that come to mind, Chris. Other yeah, I mean, those are the two that came to mind for me as well. I mean, the, the in order to have real-world empirical data on that question, you have to have a place that has both enough wind and solar generation to have a curtailment problem and enough EVs to address that curtailment problem. Right. And there just aren't that many places yet where those two conditions exist, uh, other than San Diego and Hawaii. Uh, but we do see those uh, conditions becoming more likely and we do see them evolving uh, pretty rapidly. And so that's why we wanted to send this out basically as an advance message to say, hey, you know, you need to keep an eye out on this and look for the potential of EVs as a way of curtailing, uh, as a way of avoiding curtailment. And there's, there's actually some very good empirical evidence for this, like the NREL and some of the other uh, labs have done some good detailed modeling on this, uh, including some modeling efforts out of Europe, and we do cite those in the paper. Um, for those of you who really want to dig into the details, uh, all of this stuff is, is heavily footnoted in the paper and you can go dig up the original studies that we're referencing to see exactly how they went about their modeling. Uh, we have every confidence that, um, that electric vehicles, if properly managed, can be used to avoid curtailment. So there's an important opportunity here and I think maybe it's a good note to end our call on. That is that uh, EV adopters uh, maybe a few of them just want a hot car, <laughs> uh, you know, or drivers of Teslas, but most of them have chosen uh, to purchase an EV for reasons that have to do with uh, societal values and emissions. And if that's the case, and you look at it from an electric utility perspective, engaging this, these customers has a corresponding set of kind of behavioral 
drivers to be aware of in the adoption phase. If you can connect with those customers and understand the value that they're reaching for, can communicate to them that there are certain types of charging behaviors, for example, having their vehicles plugged in as many hours as possible and giving uh, the grid or an agent or pricing signals uh, one way or another, giving over some control to allow the charging to take place at most beneficial hours. You're playing to a value system that the customer already has. And uh, so treating those customers well at the beginning and building and reinforcing uh, that behavior is something that will serve every other customer. It will serve the benefits of the grid operator and uh, society as a whole. So there's certainly, I think, an opportunity to take advantage of that, and it's one of the reasons to be more active sooner than later in, uh, in engagement with your customers around what EV charging means to the grid, to society, and ultimately to the planet. Well, with that, I think we'll conclude. We appreciate a ton of great questions. I know we didn't get to all of them. Uh, if you'd like to contact either Chris or I directly, uh, please don't hesitate to do so. The convention here at RMI is first initial, last name, rmi.org. So Jay Newcomb or C. Nelder at rmi.org. We'll look forward to turning this paper out to, uh, to our eLab membership shortly and probably be following it up with a handful of blogs because there's a lot going on in the space and as soon as you put something down on paper in, in this arena in particular, uh, there are things to add to it. So oh, thanks to all of you for your participation. Uh, we look forward to meeting you in person.